All right, welcome everyone uh, to um, our, uh, the Urban Forestry Commission, the first Urban Forestry Commission meeting um, of 2023, January 4th. Uh, there are members of the public here, Diane, Devorah, Kent, and Carol. I don't know if anyone has any comments that they'd like to they have a public comment time if they're interested. No. Not right now? Yes, it is now, okay. yes. Yep. Okay. Well, I had sent you back. Hi, I'm Diane Scott. I live on Landy Avenue here in Florence. Um, and there's a vacant lot across the street, which has yet they have not finished what they're supposed to be doing there with I don't know, something but there's not a building plan in place yet and um I had sent to Rich and all the other people that I thought it would make any difference to uh, a document that the builder had submitted to the city which gave a list of a pretty comprehensive list of what um this person thought should be done with the trees that were being removed and the thought of putting new trees in and different things. And I found out later from either Saller, Sally, Sarah Lavalley or Carolyn Mish that that wasn't something that was city um, initiated, but it was something that the builder just asked someone to do and, and um, submitted it. And I was thinking that that's actually the sort of document that I think that would make people in the city feel more comfortable if they thought that builders were expected to oh and because the city didn't do it then the city isn't isn't responsible for or able to reinforce what's in that um document or the suggestions but um having looked at it i thought that that's actually the kind of document that i think if we're concerned about um the way the city is being developed that that's the sort of document and the sort of information that the city should be looking for for builders to follow those pretty strict guidelines and I don't know Rich do you know what I'm talking about do you know the document I'm talking about yes I do and I can, I can kind of give people a little bit of context after um we have other folks that can yeah right. so I don't want to take too much time but I just want to say that that was um that's something that uh I, I do hope that the moving forward that the city does put high expectations on um builders that are expecting to um build in the city and, and he's not a resident so it's not something that's not, that you know but that it would be an expectation of all builders um that they follow these kinds of kind of rigid careful guidelines all right that's it thank you very much for hearing me thank you uh jackie welcome jackie you're still muted that's all right. Your hand is up. You're halfway there. I, I, I'm an amateur here. Um, I, I want to un underscore everything Diane said. I know what she's lived through. And uh, yeah, quality of life makes a huge difference and the trees are part of that. Uh, I also wanted to say real quick that I saw Rich at the Energy and Sustainability Committee. I don't know if everybody knows about this already, but they're going to plant a five acre uh, pollinator meadow on Smith Folk property. And this is probably just the beginning of more pollinator meadows. And I want to say, uh, don't forget the uh, milkweed. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any other public comment? No other public comment. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. All right, so I sent out um, the two sets of minutes, the one that we did not approve on 11-6, and the uh, minutes from the last meeting, which was 12-7. Did everyone have a chance to read them? The minutes from 11-6, I um, gave a little more context to the issue around the SDO and clarified um what i believe that was the point we we're that we were trying to make in regards to um the significant tree ordinance so yes jen um so you're talking about underneath the sto the third bullet that was about dbh yeah. and, yep. okay so that i didn't i uh so that got clarified yes okay and then I, the other, go ahead sorry no go ahead 
The other question I had on the next bullet down, um, it's probably just my memory, but the but the mayor did agree to mediate if there was a, um, or was somebody going to ask the mayor to mediate if there was a if we had challenges with the planning department. The the when I met with the mayor um, back in January or February last year after she was sworn in. Um, we had a discussion about the significant tree ordinance and um, she had asked me if we had ever had the uh, the former mayor of mediate and I said no we had we didn't we hadn't needed that um, she's and she suggested that if it came to that that she'd be willing to have a conversation with okay. uh, the uh, office of planning sustainability and the, and the uh, urban forestry commission if needed okay thank you Um, just the folks, whenever they are done with the minutes, if they could just let let Bonnie or myself know. <clears throat> um, I read them. Yeah, I'm done with both. I, I finished them too, so. Okay. Um, okay, that means that I've I read them already. So, all right. So can I get a motion to accept um, the minutes as um, as read, I guess. I'll make a motion to accept the meeting minutes from um, November 16th and December 7th as presented. I'll second that. Thank you. Uh, there's a motion on the floor to accept the uh, both sets of minutes and it's been seconded during discussion. <laughs> No discussion. Bonnie, could you call a roll call vote, please? I can. Rich. <clears throat> yes. Susan. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Molly. No, Molly. Jennifer. Yes. Uh, Rob. David. Yes, David. All right. Th thank you very much. Uh, let's go to our agenda. Okay, so a couple of things uh, for the chair report. Uh, um, I wanted to circle back to what Diane was talking about, Diane Scott from Landy Avenue. Um, the, uh, the property owner of the vacant lot across the street from her house um, which I forgot the address of it, but the, they actually had an assessment done by either a landscape architect or um, a um, a land surveyor in regards to what kind of tree 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 species or tree planting should happen on the property after the construction. And uh, <clears throat> what Diane was explaining it in the way that I understand it is that because that is by right construction at this point, um, there is actually no, uh, we don't, there is no format, there is no document um, that um, people have to fill out to submit to the building department to, to actually say that we are going to plant X, Y, and Z trees. Mm -hmm. um, it's not driven by um, the planning board. So it would be basically if uh, any one of you decided to uh, build a, um, for an example, if any one of you decided to build an addition on the back of your house, it's by right construction. Mm -hmm. You had to remove a tree, then you could remove the tree and you, you're not required to replace it. Um, but I think what Diane is getting at is that it would be uh, helpful if there was some sort of process or some sort of document that people would have to fill out um, that would uh, quantify or uh, try to mitigate for the loss of some of the trees on the property, whether it, for by right construction in particular. Um, and now it's something that would have to be done through the building department and then someone would have to track it all. Um, I mean, we do have the, uh, the, the uh, tree list and planting guidelines, but the building department does not, because there's no process, the building department doesn't give out that document to prospective uh, by right construction uh, builders to do tree replacements. Um, so that's, and typically, typically what I've seen from by right construction, trees are not really being planted. Trees are actually the opposite. They're being removed to make way for a single family home typically. Um, and we're lucky if there's maybe a one street tree in the front 
or they or, or they maybe do plant a few trees. I think they've done that um, over on the corner of uh, um, uh, a, a fe a Federal and uh, Warner. I think they planted some, they planted red maples, unfortunately, which is not really a tree species that we'd like. So I think it's, I think it's, uh, should be part of the overall conversation. I think it's an interesting concept and it should be part of our overall conversation about um, what our, what, you know, in our goal section about what we want to do for the actual, you know, how do we want to address these cities canopy in general and how, how do we want to, uh, you know, how do we want to better understand how much canopy loss has happened by, through by right construction, which we don't really have any metrics because there's no forms uh, when a builder pulls out a permit for by right construction, there's no checkbox that says I'm removing 10, 10 trees because it's not a requirement. So it's just another piece of the, a, a piece of the puzzle that would be interesting, I think, and helpful. Is, is that um, just for future reference, is that, is it allowed to attach that document to the minutes? that we could refer to it later. I'm just thinking like we had talked about passing the STO as it was, and then, you know, potentially getting a, a second round of, um, I don't know what you want, tree ordinance um, that dealt with these kinds of things and just for a piece of reference. I don't know if that's allowed. You mean the which document, Jen? The document that Diane is referring to. It's actually it's a yes, Diane. Actually, if you if you could get a minute, send that send me a fresh email so it's the top of my inbox, and I'll I'll distribute it to the commission. If okay, you, I'm happy to do that, and I okay. nothing. I'm happy okay. to do that. All right, thank you. Yeah, I I think it's an it's an interesting, you know, it's a, it's an interesting because right now, like I said, we have no way of tracking. Right. What's happened during by right construction for tree loss on private property right. because it's by right and it's there's no zoning, there's no local zoning that governs tree replacements, tree removals, et cetera, because the present significant tree ordinance doesn't apply to it. Mm -hmm. So um okay, another thing I'd like to bring up is that I have a request for a public shade tree hearing, um, which is not scheduled yet. It's for two trees on Coles Meadow Road. Uh, two very small trees. There's a four inch, a four and a half inch elm and a two inch sugar maple that need to be removed to make way for a driveway. Um, this property is actually, uh, it's, a, it's a piece of property that I, I was not anticipating ever being built on because it's very wet, but the, um, the property owner um, has gone through a, a tremendous amount of hoops um, with the Conservation Commission in order to build this driveway because the property is actually buildable in the back, about 150 feet, 200 feet off the road, but they have to cross a wetland area to do so. So they've done a lot of engineering work and it's been in process since 2019. My guess is that hearing will probably happen in the beginning of uh, February, but I will, once I've got it scheduled, I will keep you uh, posted. Um, another thing that I, it's not on the agenda because I wasn't sure if we were going to have time to discuss it. I, I have reached out to Carolyn Mish uh, regarding the STO and the draft changes we made. And between uh, the time off that I had at the holiday and Carolyn had off, we haven't had a chance to follow up with each other. So she just returned to work yesterday. So I'm going to try to get a hold of her by phone. Uh, in the next day or two to set up a phone conversation about um, the draft that we sent along um, uh, back in uh, de uh, December. Um, another item that I do want, I wanted to mention is that I did get a different uh, eye tree canopy assessment from uh, Dave Bloniars from, um, uh, from US Forest Service and I can share it with you, I think, let's see. Can everyone see that? Tree canopy analysis, December, 2022. Okay. So, um, and, I, and I've reached out to Dave to uh, sort of uh, try to get some data, his historical data 
based on these data points. Um, but this is uh, from December 2022, and you can see that uh, um, the, the the concentrated area right here was basically in the down in downtown and Florence center. Um, actually, it's hard to say because I can't. This is a screenshot, and I don't think I can zoom. I can't zoom in on it. There's uh, Fitzgerald. Yeah, actually, yes, that's Florence and downtown Northampton. So uh, we ended up with uh, in the in the tree in the tree column, uh, tree and shrub. We are basically about thirty nine percent canopy coverage. So you can see once once we um, extrapolate that out of the other more rural areas of the city, our canopy cover drops quite a bit because we were at sixty two percent when he when David did all the points all over the throughout the city. Um, so just for information, I, I reached out to him and asked him if he could do some historical, uh, some historical data, um, so we can have something to start with. Um, and then also if we could actually dial it right down into the different wards. So I, and I, I think that, um, it would be interesting to see all that. I haven't heard back from him, of course, because of the holiday, I would imagine. So, um, So that, that's I can share this with you. I'll send you this in an email so you can see it. Um, but I, it's just kind of interesting. We're definitely still ahead of Cambridge, <laughs> but um, but I mean it's it's you know this is like a, this is our our baseline um, for this particular for, for December. But it'd be interesting to see if he could go all the way back to uh, 1995 like he did in the original one um, that he did citywide. Uh, let's see. Okay. Let me, uh, stop sharing. Okay. All right. Anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, uh, Jackie and hi, Jackie. Can I have a copy too, please? Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. So fall planting wrap up. So I wanted to. I believe uh, Rob is not Rob's not here, so I'll speak to this. But I believe that we finished out the year uh, with planting 191 trees. But I just want to double check that. I don't have that folder open, so just give me a minute, please. These plants in 2022. Yeah, so the total is uh, 191. So if you add that to um, 1806, so we're we're almost um, we are almost at 2,000. Pretty darn close. Yeah, we're at 1,997 trees planted since. What are you dating that from? Beginning 2015 to 2022. Yeah. Now, now, granted, there were uh, there were several, or not several, there were quite a few trees that had to be uh, removed over the summer that didn't didn't quite make it either through the winter or last spring. So that. Um, the actual trees that are in the ground that are still alive, that that number will be the number will be a little lower. But um, so I, I think considering um, how we sort of had to shut off spring planting quickly, and we had the we had the drought this summer, I think we did pretty well considering we planted a hundred and almost two hundred trees. Um, and again, we'll be back at it again. Um, I'm sure uh, come springtime with some uh, with uh, a little bit of help from Rob and Jen and a few new a uh, few new faces on Tree Northampton. So, anybody have any questions, comments? 
Okay. All right. I guess I'd be um, interested in, um, Rob was kind of explaining to me that our mortality rates were phenomenally low um, until the drought, and then they inched a little bit up, but they're still pretty darn good. Yeah, Rob, Rob is there. He can speak to that. All right. Hi, Rob. You're muted. Oh, we can't hear you. Uh, how, how's that? Can you hear That's me? good. Um, Rich might have actual numbers for each year, but for many years, uh, 90 plus percent of our trees survived, maybe as high as 95. And then uh, this last, last year, as Rich was just saying, uh, I think around 70 trees, Rich, or 75. What, what's that, Rob, that died? Yeah. Yeah, I haven't. I, I, Rob and I had a little uh, quick uh, phone conversation meeting last week, and we, I got the list um, of the tree removals that were done by volunteers, Jen, Rob, Rich Parrish, and maybe a few other folks I might be missing that actually pulled trees out of the ground that had passed. Um, and I, I need to actually go out in the field and double check some of those numbers before I uh, import that data to that spreadsheet. So, so about, about, it, as many as 15% of the trees over from t the 2019, 20, 21, and 22 trees died. So we're down into the 80s for those years. Um, and the drought uh, was very difficult. And it was made more m difficult by the staffing issues at DPW. And those issues, I think, are likely to get worse rather than better. Um, because the DPW has been unable to hire replacements as people retire or leave because the wages aren't competitive. Um, and nothing rich can do about that. That's a just a structural issue with the pay scales. So, you know, it, I want to say that our failure rate in some ways is just a reason to plant more trees because uh, <laughs> we have to replace now all the ones that die, which is like around 75 trees from last year. Um, uh, the, can you speak to the industry standard or um, average? Rich might actually know, but I think if you get 85% of the trees to live, you're doing really well. Yeah. I, I, Go ahead, Jen. 85 to 90 per, 95 percent survival rate, you know, previous to the drought, like is unheard of in industry, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it just speaks to the, I think, from you know, I'm an insider, but from an outsider looking in in my other roles, um, it's just this incredible um cooperative uh effort between the DPW and Tree Northampton and the volunteers we have out, you know, pruning and weeding and checking. And, you know, um, I know it's gonna be challenging. We'll have to put our heads together about watering because that's the key. I mean, that's really, really the key, but, um, uh, you know, even in the 80% in an, in an, in an, uh, in a public right of ways or, you know, it's kind of amazing really. And so uh, speaking of the watering, so to, to really water the trees effectively it, when it's hot and dry, it takes two DPW trucks on the road for most of a week, each week. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's likely to, to be less than one full-time employee available. You know, as a full-time employee with multiple tasks is, you know, might be what we have. So we have to we have to think about that. And I and I, it's been very difficult to fill in the watering gap with with volunteers. We've tried. We've had different things that we've tried, but um, may not work so well. It's a lot of water to move. I mean, right. they have tanks of two hundred and fifty gallons. I think three, they're, they're, they're three hundred. So about twelve thousand gallons a week. 
that has to be moved. So 12,000 gallons is just a lot to move unless you have like a mechanized system, which of course the DPW does. And But the DPW, again, is short-staffed. And Rich, you, it's very likely that you'll be short-staffed this summer, right? I mean, you know, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that question. Right now, industry trends are telling our, my, my personal, my personal take is is that the the type of folks that actually are attracted to the industry that we're in um the entry level positions are not being filled because there is a stiff competition uh for a, the uh multitude of uh large infrastructure projects that are being done all around the country the other thing too is because everyone in our department has to have a commercial driver's license <sighs> Um, so the other thing too is that, um, as you all know, most of our goods and our goods run uh, by uh, tractor trailer, which is wow. Class A CDL drivers. So those folks are at a deficit and they're in premium, wow. and so that that is really where um, it's really a supply and demand issue. So I don't know the answer to that question, Rob. I mean, we've had a few um, applicants for seasonal labor positions for the winter months, uh, so that's been good. But obviously, in the winter, we're not watering trees and we need the people uh you know we need folks in the summer months so i i don't know i i i'm hoping uh, i'm hopeful that we will you know um things are going to be a little better this this year we'll we'll just have to see what happens but i think rob is correct we might have to temper our um planting numbers uh, because you know we've indicated we planted 191 trees this past year, so that's 191 water bags. If we plant 100 another 190, um, you know we're we're now at 400 trees. And then if you happen to have to water the trees that were planted in 2021 or 2020, 2020, I mean because of the drought. I mean we were going back, we were watering trees that were planted in 2016 on an individual basis um, because the drought was so bad. So. Um, so, I mean, I think that uh, is a little bit of uh, food for thought. It might give us a little bit of pause about how many we plant, where we plant, you know, strategically thinking it's much easier to water 20 trees that are straight in a row versus having one tree uh, in lead center versus another tree uh, down by the Northampton bowling alley, et cetera. So, um, the other thing I wanted to mention to you is that uh, I know Carol, I see your hand is up. I'll get, we'll get to you in one one minute, please. Uh, is that the trees that were planted in the two projects, the one on Lower Pleasant Street and the one on King Street? I have not accounted for those trees yet. So the actual planting numbers are above two hundred, um, but those are not added because those projects are not there. Those projects have not been completed. So in essence, with the help of contractors. In those two projects, we are over the 200 mark, which would push us over the 2000 mark. Mm. Uh, it's just that they were planted by others. So I'll, I will have a little more. Um, once those, once I add all that in, I'll have a little, I'll have a little better handle on what we have probably by our next meeting. Uh, hi, Carol. Go ahead. Hi. Um, thanks for letting me ask a question. Sure. Um, I'm just curious. Have you analyzed um, what kind of trees have died? you know, which species of trees have died and- so you, If I could just say something, because we've been pointing to the drought as a major cause of tree dying. And I think it may be the major cause, but we've lost a lot of tulip trees, a lot. And, mm -hmm. and those trees um, die also due to weather issues, which are different in that um, they're, they're desiccating, they're drying out. What happens is the, as Rich has explained to me, the ground is frozen. It becomes very hot. Like this spring, it became hot while the ground was frozen and windy. The trees, uh, literally the stems just dry right out and then they're dead. And because they can't draw any moisture out of the frozen ground. So you, you can't have a, particularly tulip trees can't have hot, dry weather um, while the ground's frozen. And that's what happened last mm -hmm. spring. We lost a lot, of them. so that that's part of it. And and the tulip trees, I think, are particularly important to plant because they are a, um, a diversity and they're quick growing. And uh, so, again, although you might say, "Well, stop planting them if they keep dying," but um, I, I think it's really important to to uh, 
succeed with that species. And um, I have another question. Have you, you know, and I don't know where all the trees are planted. I'm sure a lot of them don't have a home like right across from them. But have you tried to get neighbors to water? Yeah, it's pretty unsuccessful. Yeah. Yeah, what happens is that even if you get someone really well-meaning mm -hmm. and they water it, then they go away for three weeks and right. some <laughs> the tree yeah. you know, suffers. It's pretty hard. Um, but uh, we do try. Um, it, it's really hard to fill the water bags if you can't get a hose out to them. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, we live in an environment where an awful lot of people can't even reach the trees with their hoses. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty unsuccessful. I'm curious, we saw a lot of very challenging root balls. And my understanding is that the pandemic caused a bottleneck where, or a lag so that some trees, vendors had to hold on to trees longer and some of the root balls got out of hand. Do you anticipate that might help? harm our um, survival rates. Definitely. We've had a hard time with um, the suppliers because um, it was very, very, very competitive to get trees. So we were getting them under um, sized in order to get them early before they were sold. And then uh, there was a complete halt. Uh, in fact, this year, Rich can probably correct me deep, DCR, I think, stopped planting the entire summer. I don't think they, they planted at all. So yeah, that, what yeah, that, that does is they're the major buyer of trees. So trees that they would have bought and planted last year will be what were what's available to us next year because the, the grower won't get new trees. So yeah, uh, to Sue's point, we're not getting the, the uh, root balls that we would prefer. Um, so they, they stay in the contain the container too long and they start to circle and grow in uh, unhealthy formations. And when we were planting trees, it was really challenging deciding which roots to cut off because they were going to be detrimental to other parts of the tree, which to leave on in order to, for it to have enough root mass to survive for a lot of judgment. Yeah, and I think that this kind of dislocation in the industry of like stopping and starting, I mean, might just keep happening. Um, you know, it's kind of amazing. These, in the face of this problem of the drought, DCR stopped entirely. And or they just, in the spring, they just stopped planting for the whole year. And we went ahead. That might increase the rate of trees that die. But um, they... They were partly influenced by the fact that the drought on the, I think on the east part of the state was more severe. So that they were reacting as a state rather than as a region. So it's- They stopped because of the drought, not the pandemic. Right, they, well, for, first the, that's the pandemic ruined the tree crop, the, the nursery, then the drought. The pandemic, you know, each of them is causing waves of trees to be to not be sold at the right time the pandemic and the drought because we planted through the pandemic but dcr also stopped then for a period yeah it's it's kind of messy any and getting stock has always been the most challenging part of the whole endeavor getting the right species the right um condition the right time to plant in places we want them yeah so this year when we went to buy stock um they hadn't really we were basically looking for the most part at the same stock that we'd had the year before so it's, it's sort of like it's sort of like when you're in traffic and the cars slow down and then you wonder why you're still slow and then it start, starts up again. It's like a little like that. Because of Thank course you, the Brad. trees we're buying, someone had to plant them eight years ago um, or so about. So yeah, so the linden trees are tough. The ginkgo trees are difficult 
the root structures of the ginkgos are difficult, the lindens. Um, uh, and so, the, yeah, a lot of those died. Any, any other questions? Uh, Carol. Yeah, so I know that tulip trees are native, but I, ginkgos and um, and um, lindens aren't, right? The, so wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you focus on planting native trees? Don't they? I don't they have a better chance? And so actually, support, so and they also support you know the wildlife that we need to support. Yeah, so, so lindens are are native, uh, a native uh, genus. Um, but the species of ginkgo that we plant is not native because the native species, and this is sort of to your point, would be nice if we could grow up, but they're incredibly sensitive to heat and drought. So we can't plant uh, native lindens. And uh, we have trouble with maples. We can't plant ash. We obviously have a big problem with chestnuts. Mm -hmm. So most of the trees that make up the large shade trees of the Northeast, you can't plant. Um, uh, that's why I do think it's worth continuing with the tulip trees because they are native. Um, there's um, I understand, I've learned or understood also that ginkgos, for instance, are um, chosen because of the um, trees in towns serving benefits of shade um, and there are pest threats for a lot of native trees and in order to hedge ourselves against the urban heat we plant a diversity of trees so that if we have pests that wipe out one species of native tree we'll have a variety of different species yeah, so, so yeah, I mean, we need a great variety. And, and so the native, the native trees that are really strong that we, um, that we can plant are probably oaks are the strongest um, genus that we can plant. But the city of Northampton already has pretty much enough oaks. Um, there's a subtlety to it because most of the oaks are red oaks. And within the genus of oaks, the red oaks and the white oaks, I don't know, I don't know how to put it, but like if, if they were family, they're kind of distant family. There's a, there's a big separation between them. So in a way, white oak and red oak is almost like two different genuses and in that they react differently to different pests and different um, uh, disastrous uh, like oak wilt and uh, conditions yeah so i let, i just want to hop in here carol we um in 2016 we had a tree inventory done we um did one as with a volunteer group and then we had matching funds and had davy tree do a tree inventory um and one of the results of that was then we could determine uh, uh the types of trees we had how many of each type of tree and kind of the percentages in the canopy. So when we um, have thought about um, planting, um, there's a couple key things we're trying to, goals we're trying to meet. There's some guidelines around percentages of family, percentage of species, percentage of genus. There's a couple of recommendations. Cornell has one. Um, uh, in a in a in your public tree canopy. So we try to um, we've tried to think about that. Take all the data we have and think about that. So and um, just in general, we have tried pretty hard to plant as many native trees as we can. Um, the conditions of the um, the strips within 20 feet of the roadways, the public right of way um, in the industry are often called hell strips. And they're called that because it's, the soil is really disturbed. It's often compacted. 
you've got not good water penetration, all these various things. It's hotter, snow gets piled up, there's salt. So that really decreases the amount of tree species in general that we can choose from. So we do, I just wanna reassure you that we try pretty hard to use as much native stock as we can. And, um, you know, and there's always new um, trees uh, being developed, you know, new selections being made through various plant breeding and other ways. And um, I know Rob, you know, has taught me about several new, there's a brand new, um, more upright and narrow tulip tree, for example, you know, that we've started to use. So um, I just want to just say that we've like taken a lot of different uh, factors and we, um, what we want is successful tree canopy. And what um, Susan was, Sue was talking about is, um, you know, part of the reason to have the mix is if there is a pest that comes in like emerald ash borer that's killing every single ash tree. In the Midwest, entire neighborhoods had zero trees in it, like about 10 years ago because they had to cut them all down because they were all ash trees. They were the same thing. It's like a monoculture. So um, there's a lot of different parts and um, we, we would not be able to successfully have the percentage of tree canopy we have if we only used native trees in, well, in, the, in the environment that we have to plant. It, a twist on native, which is that um, recently, I mean, there are so few natives that you'll just walk out in the forest and see that we can use. Because I mean, basically, if you walk into our forest, for the most part, you'll see maples and oaks and birches. And uh, and then most of the native birches aren't applicable to an urban environment. You can't plant beech trees either. They're already off the list of plantable trees. So, so most of the trees in the forest aren't applicable to urban forestry um, because of all the diseases and the conditions. But one, this is kind of a positive note and I think kind of a cool thing and something we can really look forward to is that um, there are a whole bunch of, there are a bunch of trees that do grow to the south of us and that, that did live up here until the ice age pushed them south. And in some places they've, in some regions of the country, they've already gone north. So for instance, Kentucky coffee trees are already up towards Minnesota, but they just don't happen to be here. And so we're doing assisted migration. The Kentucky coffee tree is something that did grow here and will grow here again, but we don't want to wait a million years for it to get here. So we are planting Kentucky coffee trees. And then Jen was talking about how there are new trees coming along, is that the Kentucky coffee tree is, is quite a giant tree. And so it's hard to find a place to put it maybe. Um, but a new tree is essentially, we're talking about um, not um, engineered trees, not GM trees, but trees that, um, so these would be cultivars. This is just where someone noticed a patch of K Kentucky coffee trees that are small, that don't grow very big. And so they then clone them. So we have something called an espresso Kentucky coffee tree which is really cool because it, it, it fits a lot of places and it grows really, really well. And, uh, and, we can, and we've planted a lot of those. And they're, they're, they're gonna be quite successful, I think. Um, the espressos, it's kind of a joke, but that's it, Kentucky coffee tree. And then there's the sweet gum sweet also. Gum, yeah. And the sweet gum tree is just beautiful. It grows as far north as New Jersey right now, but obviously we're gonna have a climate warmer than New Jersey before too long. And um, and they grow quite well here, but there there are uh, the species one doesn't grow very well. There's a there's a selection um, a cultivar called a moraine, uh, which grows quite well. And we've tried a whole bunch of other ones, and they've all more or less failed. The sweet gums, but we do have one. That's, we've got quite a few of them growing, and, and I, I think we're going to have a lot more sweet gums. And so. What looks like non-native, I'm just pointing this out. You might think, oh, well, that's not a native, but but I think sweet gum is um, mm -hmm. a lot of people in the in the in the field think of anything that grows in eastern United States as now native because the climate of eastern the United States is kind of mixed up at this point. And so I would also throw bald cypress in as a native in that sense. Um, we also have um Nissus avaticas, black gums. 
which like the um, tulip tree, isn't that common this far north, but um, they actually do grow all the way into Vermont. So the Mrs. Havatica is another, um, you know, these are like hidden, hidden natives that you'll find more in New Jersey and uh, Virginia and North Carolina. Um, I'm not an ecologist, but from my reading, um, we we have done some re I have done some reading when we're looking at um, groves we've planted, for instance, on eco benefits, and these trees Rob speaks of speak of are reported to have significant eco benefits: sweet gum, Nisus avatica, black gum, or tu black tupelo, and these other trees do. You might not see them out in our forests right now, but with this assisted migration, which is now something it's talked about, not just here in Northampton, but quite wild, widely about people bringing these trees in. Um, they do have tremendous numbers of, of species of animals that they, you know, in, insects and animals that they support. Yeah, so uh, that, that's, that's where I think you actually sent me an article a few years ago where people were doing studies is to if you if you have a place that doesn't have any native natives, that's not so good. But if you have a place that has some natives and also has a lot of other things, the other things often become hosts to various insects and bugs and birds. Um, so uh, there was the article was saying a great deal of diversity can be as positive as having a all you don't have to have all native to to attract there there is an exception the ginkgo which definitely doesn't host anybody and that's partly why the urban foresters like it because uh when everything else gets ravaged and eaten up you still have your ginkgo tree intact for instance uh, asian longhorn beetle is a is a big threat and has um Cause the destruction of I don't know, fifty thousand trees in the Worcester region. Um, yeah. The ginkgos can even survive that. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the in the so, excuse me, Rob. Uh, we're a little we're yeah. Let's go over our time. All right. Here. So um, onward. Diane has her hand up. Diane, you have a quick question. I do. Um, and I know I heard this someplace and maybe it was at a meeting here, but I heard somewhere that it said if you can sort of adopt a tree, like if there are trees near you that um, you think you could water to to do that. It was during the drought during the summer. And I'd be happy to do that. Like I live along Nonatuck Street and I'd be happy to do a few trees. But do you guys keep like a list of what trees need help, what trees don't like who like when I go to your website, what would I do to find out what trees? do need to be watered uh the easiest thing to do is that when we're actually going to be reaching out to residents we, you i would just we would just communicate by email and try to find a few trees okay they're close to you that you'd be willing to commit to to water them and then what i would do is i would take them off our master list and the dbw staff doesn't go there and okay. that's the problem that rob alluded to is when folks commit to watering a tree but then they go away for three weeks in the summer Oh yeah, right. Which you know I do, Rich. Yeah, I, well, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just, hypothetically, you you, ne you never know. But yes, thank you for your offer. All and, right. Uh, so keep that in mind. So an email from like just something we get from the city stuff or or uh, uh, no, no, typically like uh, if you subscribe to uh, Tree Northampton's um, listserv. Okay. So, tree uh, Northampton. Okay. Tree, yeah, Tree Northampton will send out a reminder to water trees, and then. You can follow that up either with Tree Northampton about some trees that are close to where you live, or you can directly contact me. All right. Okay. Yeah, because you know they've done a ton on Nonetuck Street, and I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, so if you email uh, Tree Northampton at gmail.com. Terrific. If you live near tr trees that don't have water bags on them, so the city's only watering trees if you can see a, a water bag, you know, those big green bags. Mm -hmm. But if it's hot and dry out and you see any tree that's less than six inches in diameter, maybe less than four inches, and you can put some water on it when it's hot and dry, that's that's a positive. Well, I'd be driving around with gallons of water in my trunk. So, I mean, it's not something that I would just. Yeah, see, that's. There's none that's, on my street. There's none on my street. Oh, okay. so five gallons a tree or more. Right. Right. Yeah, so, it takes I mean, a lot of water. 
Yeah, but you fill up 10 gallon jugs and, you know. Yep. Wonderful. But okay. Thanks. So I'm just saying that even just doing that when a tree looks sad, even if it doesn't have a water bag on it, just on your own, just you see a tree, help it. Okay. That works. Right. And and if you need a place to plant trees, there's this empty lot across the street. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Thank you. Email oh. us. I will. Thank you. Please. Uh, all right. Uh, moving along to goals for 2023. Now, I put this on there without any bullet points underneath it because I wanted to have commissioners start to think about what they'd like to accomplish for 2023. Um, and we do have some leftover goals from last year that we distilled in that spreadsheet um, that we didn't we didn't get accomplished, obviously, because uh, we were only able to do so much. Um, anybody have any Molly? Well, I think one of the goals um, that we've talked about before um, is the setback plantings and. Um, Involve, and that involves some outreach to people, um, you know, homeowners with either, you know, a, a knocking on their door or um, uh, a little flyer door hanging or something like that to, you know, basically solicit people to see if they'd be interested in having a setback tree at the sites that we've identified before. Okay. And I, that, uh, I have that door hanger is in a draft. Um, and I was actually going to have a leak. I, so I'm, I will, um, I'll package that back up and send it out to commissioners for comment. Before. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, Jen. Uh, I would like to list, I think we should do one to two um, public information outreach events around spotted lanternfly. And one that would be, I think, pretty easy to accomplish would be to have some type of um, uh, person table when at the uh, tree whip giveaway, mm -hmm. you know, with information, maybe a poster board, somebody who has some knowledge that can, you know, we can train volunteers to talk about spot and lantern fly, get some stuff from MBAR to give away, you know, the little, little cards or the you know, the sheets or things like that. They have a, they have a whole website that we can get free stuff from, so. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, Sue. Um, I'd like to see a priority, um, and um, Devorah kind of helped me think of this, is by asking like, so what's up with the whips? Do they survive? Um, it got me thinking that um, with all our concern for the loss of trees in yards that are being subdivided and, and planted on, to have a campaign, maybe also at the Arbor Day, um, teaching people how to protect a tiny tree and how to select good species of tiny trees and care for them. Because um, from my um, reading, I understand that a tree that's actually grown from a very small whip or even a seed is going to be a lot better off than all these trees that get dug up after eight years and moved around. And to get people to an information campaign, education campaign, to get people planting trees in their backyards and caring for them, putting a little fence around them so they don't get eaten by the bunnies and watering them rather than, you know, we can try to legislate and get people to, you know, agree to let us control trees on private property. But um, I think it would be more beneficial to try to get people on board to just plant trees. Um, Cause also, I mean, even if they're chopping down trees to develop, um, we need a succession of young trees coming up for the future people. Um, yeah, so it's sort of a, a program to create um, both the access and the information for people so that they can take a 16 inch whip and grow a tree. And it happens all the time. It happens all the time, but only by people who are sort of garden gardener types, um, which isn't that, you know, people who are, are good at, 
the gardening. Um, I have a gardening neighbor. She has a whip from every year of tree giveaway going back decades. Exactly. And so bringing her, her knowledge That's and ability to unusual. the population, that would be. If we could get all those whips to survive, that'd be a lot of trees. Yeah. Nice. Another thing related to spotted lanternfly is, um, well, first of all, Jen and I need to meet to sort of put together all these ideas, but one that just pops into my head is um, setting up some kind of monitoring program uh, at the sites where we know there are elanthus trees that we could, you know, maybe get permission from some of those landowners that we could monitor um, on a regular basis and check to see if, if it's infested yet so that we could report it as soon as possible. Yep, I, th I think that's good. Molly, you're gonna let, you, you or Jen will let me know when you wanna meet and we can formulate an agenda. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, Jen. Um, the other thing I was thinking about um, is uh, there was a lot of interest when we were completing the last iteration of the significant tree ordinance to look into kind of the, I don't know what you wanna call it, the next level of, of tree regulation. And we had a lot of community members that were um, interested. Um, so I'm, I, I'm not interested in chairing this, but I, I, I think the interest is there to, to use the data you're starting to generate with Dave Bloniars to um, you know, look at, take, take a look at that data, are we losing, um, trees from by right construction. And if we are, then a group to work on, what do we do about that? So, and I think it, I think we have a lot of energy even on this screen regarding that issue. So. Yep. I, I, I agree with you. Um, and I believe Sue, Sue Lofthouse and I were actually going to uh, set up a, uh, a meeting with Kent to, because Kent uh, has volunteered to help us kind of sift through the data. Um, and I'm trying to pull stuff in from uh, US Forest Service. I also reached out to um, uh, University of Vermont, um, the spatial, I can't remember, Jarlith is his name. I can't remember his full name, unfortunately. I apologize, it escapes me. Don't write that down, Bonnie. I don't want to hack up that guy's name. <laughs> um, Ken probably knows who he is, but I, he, he had not responded to the email where I actually asked if they would be interested in taking us on as some kind of a project um, to or trying to at least direct us uh, in the right, uh, send us in the right direction to get this data. But I do think we need to spend the time to, to capture data and then distill it and then determine, um, you know, if um, if there is canopy loss, how much there is, specifically where it is, what, what can we what can we attribute it to, and how can we um, correct it or you know, mitigate for the canopy loss, whether it's through a huge planting campaign or whether it's through awareness. Um, I'm going through our elected leaders, uh, creating some kind of um, you know, legislation that would be um, added at the um, ordinance level. So definitely think it's an interesting, I, I mean, I'd like to, I think just having the data alone will be interesting enough to really kind of sort of send us in the right direction. Uh, because again, as I mentioned earlier, there is zero data when someone is building a new house by right, you, you know, they just, as long as they can, they can clear up to an acre without a permit. Once you get over an acre for a single family by right construction, then you have to actually have a stormwater permit because mm -hmm. now you're actually removing uh, over an acre of your this is disturbance of over an acre. And there's effectively an issue with uh, stormwater runoff to either other properties or into the street and uh, into those. They have to have a, a whole engineering study done, hydrology study with a, uh, then there's a stormwater permit. Um, and that falls under the city's uh, stormwater, um, well, the state and city stormwater regulations. So, you know, we don't have anything like that for trees for by right construction, but I mean, it definitely would be something that I think we need to 
we need to take a look at for sure. So, so that's that's fourth. That's four things on this list. Any anyone else, Molly? I found that guy's name. I just looked it up. It's Jarlath O'Neill Dash Dunn. It's yes. J A R L A T H is his first name. Yep. And then it's O'Neill. Yep. Dash D U N N E. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, kind of redirect that email that I sent to him. And then Sue, I'll be in touch with you with lots of meeting times um, to maybe we can connect with Kent. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, any? I'll, I'll just uh, I'll just br briefly say that I would love to continue working with schools, kind of uh, to build on the good work we did last year. And I know Jen, you're meeting with the principal of Leeds School on Monday, but I'd love to meet with. Uh, uh, do the same thing with the high school and the middle school and Bridge Street, and if each school accepts roughly 16 trees, that's that's quite a significant number. Plus, I I find parents um, are, are are pretty good uh, watering volunteers, and you can use sort of uh, you know the water from the school spigot. So there is a excuse me, David. There's a yeah. time for that meeting on Monday. Uh, yeah, I can, I can look it up. I think it's in the afternoon on Monday. Yeah, I don't think I, God, I don't, I don't think I got that confirmation. I thought somebody was going to get in touch with me. Okay. So after this could, meeting, we'll. Yeah, great. If you, you thank you. I so great to hear your meeting with Leeds. Yeah, there, there's, there's ah. people, other people helping. It's, uh, yeah, it's great. David, David, like. Psh, red carpet for me so <laughs> that's all i gotta say yeah yeah to to uh to just to comment on that i'm uh i'm part of the nesc and we're i'm part of a subgroup on nest we're meeting with the individual stakeholders throughout the city that actually manage city property to discuss potential pollinator planting locations on uh in areas where there's ornamental turf that is mowed uh, just to keep it mowed for no particular reason. There's no sporting events. There's no playground. Um, you know, so we've met with uh, Smith Vocational School. We've met with um, DBW. I've been the representative from DBW. We're now meeting with Central Services to try to ascertain if there's um, locations that are maintained that could be actually uh, just uh, not maintained and made into pollinator planting. So. That's also something that's coming down the pike, which is also, I think, really helpful uh, in our goal to become more sustainable and sequester more carbon and actually reduce our carbon offset by not mowing constantly. In, is there, is, go ahead, so, uh, Jen, sorry. In, in part of that discussion, is there um, uh, kind of awareness that every so often you would have to like cut that down to prevent woody stuff from taking over? Yes. So, so is that included in the discussion? Because yeah. often I've been involved in plantings and it's all great. And then nobody maintain, you know, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we, we are we are tentatively going to partner with Smith Vocational School. There's a five acre piece uh, that that abuts the um, right across the street from where Scotty's the drive in is mm -hmm. a parcel there that's just mowed um, that they don't do anything with. And they are the trustees have tentatively agreed to let uh, to do some kind of pollinator uh, planting area there. And we're hopeful to get some funds from NESC and actually have the students actually do the, the uh, soil preparation. And then hopefully they would mow it every other year, um, you know, just sort of like we do here at the cemetery to, to keep all the woody, uh, the woody material out of the, out of the area. So so, I mean, I, the, you know, I've worked here for a long time and I have to say, and going back to what David just said about the schools, there is such a change in um, people's attitudes towards using school properties for uh, things other than just playgrounds and sports. And so I think it's really a ripe time to plant, try to get, uh, as David said, more trees planted at all other different schools and also try to diversify some of the other parcels that we could probably plant trees on, but you can't really get to them to water them. That's the problem. Um, so, um, so that's why meeting with other stakeholders, and that includes Conservation Commission. Um, I think we're thinking about reaching out to the folks at um, Look Park 
uh, to see if they have any land that they would be interested in doing like a pilot demonstration for pollinators on. So that's another thing that's kind of in the works. It's not part of our goals, but I just wanted to sort of keep you um, abreast of that. I just, um, I don't know an awful lot about it, but I understand that, for instance, willow are key species for pollinators and some of these off the grid, off the beaten path outside of the right of way, the public way um, to consider trees as pollinator plants too. Yeah, yep, agreed. Uh, any other, anyone else have any goals? Rob. I just wanted to say something quickly because Jen's meeting with the people at Leeds. I'm going to be out there and also for you, Rich. There's a big field there that's no longer used. Like it was a it was a soccer field or something. The teachers pointed it out to me. I looked at it and thought, well, we can't get water to it. So but when I say big, it's like a whole soccer field. It's just nothing there. Just empty. And it's mowed regularly by the, you know, so we're polluting by, you know. So notice it when you're there, it's kind of, it's towards the road down the hill. Thanks, I'll, I'll ask about it, thank you. Great. Um, and I, I think um, I can leave this, um, I could leave this on the next agenda so people can sort of think about this a little more and we can have another discussion. And Bonnie, if you wouldn't mind just sort of capturing the goals that we talked about on the minutes. So Absolutely. Yeah. We can, we can have them as a review point. Um, yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, and anyone, any other commissioners, feel free um, to send me an email for anything specific you'd like to see on the next agenda in regards to the goals. Um, I, I, uh, the future UFC meetings and guest speakers. So um, I'm actually looking for input from from other commissioners about who you would like to see as guest speakers because I, I I enjoyed having at least one guest speaker a month. I don't know if you felt that was too much or if you think we should do it every other month, given the fact that we do meet twice a month. We do we we meet more frequently than any other body other than the city council. So I didn't know if you felt that was helpful. Um, I think it's helpful um, as long as they're, you know, really relevant. I mean, I wouldn't want to just say we, we have to find somebody just to have somebody. <laughs> oh, but, yeah. 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 No, I mean, I, I, I would think, for example, um, it would be interesting to have um, um, like if someone like Jarlith or, or someone would want to come to a meeting to kind of give us an overview of um mm you know, uh, you know, the G GIS and how it operates in relation to trees and just how the data, how that all works. But I agree with you, it would have to be some something that is surrounds something that we're either working on, yeah. uh, hmm. something we like to work on. So um, maybe like an area of that would be that could be useful is not so much directly about biology of trees and stuff, but more about communications. Okay. And like good ways to communicate, you know, whether you're making a um, flyer or a door hanger or talking to people at their door, you know, maybe there's people who could help us along those lines. Okay. Three communicators. I know sometimes I listen to the Texas A&M podcast. Um, I don't know if anybody else has come across that one. They have a uh, few people talking about you know how to how to communicate in the community with tree about trees advocate for trees hmm. i've never never heard sue could you forward is there a, a link you could send us i've never even sure. heard yeah, of yeah it's i mean i i think that i th i think in all in a molly hit on a good note there because i i don't know i spend most of my time talking i think to people like when we're out planting and we're doing uh or I'm actually, you know, even not planting when I'm out doing tree inspections and I'm standing there looking at a tree. Someone will come to me and say, what are you looking at? And why are you here? And what are you going to do? And are you going to cut it down? And what about the trees in my backyard? And, you know, so there's this whole level of dialogue that happens that uh, mm -hmm. typically sort of happens organically. Um, and, um, but it's helpful to actually have um, a little bit of a framework. I think that's one of the things that 
that we seem to not be able, to, we don't seem to be, we, we could do a better job of communicating with the public, I think as a whole. The, the, the issue is though, is that how, how as a commission do we communicate? For example, um, going back to um, talking about spotter lanternfly, and actually um, um, having some kind of uh, informational, in, like an informational session, you know, that's where we would actually, we want to make sure that we're communicating with people effectively um, so they actually understand. So, I mean, actually, I, I do think it's a good topic. So I can, if you have uh, anyone in your mind that you think would be good for us to actually have, please let me know if I will put my thinking cap on. Um, and then I'm not sure if you wanted some other like technical type speakers that would be taught like Greg Beck from Bartlett. Um, they, Greg always has other topics that he can dis discuss with us. But again, I think you're correct about talking about things that are pertinent to what the commission is uh, presently um, working on. But again, that's, um, we can sort of leave that open. Well, another sort of thing kind of related to communication is um, this whole idea of expanding the, you know, tree regulation onto private property. And maybe there's, I don't know what this would be exactly, but like um, guidance about how to approach that, like how to, um, you know, what are the best things to keep in mind to if we do decide to put that idea forward, I'm not sure who, what kind of professional would be doing that kind of thing. It would be someone who's like a, someone who markets things. Yeah, I guess it'd so. Be like a marketing agent or a marketing person. Right. Yeah. That really would be, I guess. Yeah. For a better term. Okay. Carol, maybe Carol has an idea. She's got her hand up. Go ahead, Carol. I, um, I thought that the commission already decided to work on a no, new ordinance for private property. I didn't, when you just said that, I was surprised, Molly, that you raised it as a question about working on it, because that was my understanding that after getting the other ordinance done, that the commission was going to start working on that. I do also have ideas well, for speakers, but. Um, I think my understanding of it is we wanted to first look at this, um, all the LIDAR um yeah. data yeah. and see if the canopy actually is declining as a number one thing um because that would make a difference in how or if we approach it well that makes sense to look at that but i think it's still a good idea to preserve trees even if the canopies hasn't decreased a lot but we can talk about that another time when you talk about that but i don't know who who you've you know i haven't been coming to meetings that long but maybe i could give rich some ideas about like i don't know are you working with the um any pollinator groups besides the you know the groups you mentioned on the pollinator um plantings like um you know things i i just i know some people but you might know them too. So I don't want to spend time, you know, waste your time, but you know, also there's like Doug Tallamy, people are from, are people familiar with Doug Tallamy? You could watch one of, if you, maybe you've already done it, but like you could watch one of his short talks during a meeting mm. or another time and then discuss it. There's plenty of, um, there's so much online, mm. you know, That's... you can watch and get educated on something, but I don't know what you've done. And I know that, you know, you know a lot more I think than I do about certain certainly about a lot of subjects about trees, so I don't want to be presumptuous. Thanks okay. for your input. No, that th those are all really great. Those are really great suggestions. We have uh, we we had uh, Owen Wormser, um, yeah, from Western Mass Pollinators. Western Mass Pollinators. I I, I think yeah, there's is. Western Mass Pollinator Network and Owen. I know Owen. Yep. And we we had we had Owen uh, come to a meeting and kind of talk about uh, pollinators and um, because they actually did a pollinator planting on the side of City Hall where right. we were going to be planting um, some we were hopeful to plant some public shade trees there but we deferred um, because of the pollinator planting and also because that potentially was going to be the area where there was going to be um, the new uh, resilience hub was going to be built but i think that's off the table now because the resilience hub potentially is going to be in the old uh 
um, church on uh, the corner of uh, Elm and West Street. So, and um, Doug Tallamy, I actually listened to a talk last year uh, that he did for a um, Friends of the Library in Chelmsford or somewhere. I zoomed in on it. It was very interesting. Um, I bought his book actually, and um, I am uh, I'm I'm going to read it. Uh, it's in my queue to be read um, about oaks and their value in the urban landscape. So right. um, I found him to be really super interesting. So there is a lot of there is a lot of online presence um, of information. The question is, is that what like what is the I guess my only thing is what's the best use of our time that we have as a commission because we this is really the only time that we can all work together mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and actually make decisions and move things forward. Um, so it would be great, Carol, if you could send me like a list, a short list of things that you think would be good for us to actually listen to or watch or read on our own time. Okay, I'll maybe, work on that. And then maybe we could bring some of those things back to the commission so we can discuss them and see how we could actually make them some kind of an action item. Yeah. Something. That would be helpful. Okay. I mean. I, I think it's really great. Um, I, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, there should be a goal, but it, it's not a pressing goal, is that I think uh, as a commission, we need to zoom out a little farther and have some conversations with the Amherst uh, Shade Tree Commission. Um, a having a joint meeting with them, I think, would be helpful um, just to kind of talk about um, these. And you probably can't see this, but because uh, it's Sorry, never mind. This was uh, this was statewide tree issues. I don't have it electronically, but statewide tree issues that the Amherst Public Shade Tree Committee was working on. Chapter 87 updates, complete streets law, solar farm siting laws, and funding for trees. There's a house bill. So I can resend this to you, but I think it might be some stuff that's interesting that we could work sort of like on a grassroots level with another uh, yeah. commission. Um, because I think, you know, power is in numbers, right, as we all know, um, whether it's, uh, you know, usually, and they have a lot of experience. Um, and actually, we're, we're kind of, our commission is kind of modeled after their commission. So, um, so that, you know, trying to actually have that dialogue with other commissions statewide, I think is beneficial. If not, if nothing happens, at least we've, we've learned from, you um, you know, maybe some of the things they've done successfully, some of the things they have not. Yes, Jen. Uh, once you said that, I I just thought we have an opening on our commission, we, correct? So one yes. of our goals should be to fill that. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, which actually I was going to say for the end of the meeting, but we're close to the end. Does anyone else have any other guest speaker thoughts that they want to talk about. Okay. No, but can I say something um, related to what Jen, Jen just said? Um, all of you who are from the public who are at this meeting, um, if by chance you are interested in being on the commission, we do have an opening. And I think the procedure is you have to fill out a form. You have to kind of apply for it to through the mayor's office. Is that right, Rich? Yes. I remember right. If anyone is interested, uh, they can just reach out to me and I'll get you a link. Um, thank you, Molly. Uh, which brings me to um, any other business not anticipated by the chair. Uh, right before the meeting, I sent you a link. I sent you an email that contains a link. Um, it is from Laura Krutzler, who is um, who actually, I will get the email up here. Hold on one second. So this is from the uh, City Council Select Committee survey, um, and they're interested in understanding barriers to serving on appointed boards and commissions. Mm. So they have asked, and you'll see in the email, they have asked all of us to actually um, uh, fill out the survey to uh, from all the members of the commission or committee. And it's, I don't know how long, I haven't done it yet. I don't know how long it is, but it basically is gonna ask us uh, a whole bunch of questions I think so they're, they are um, a group of uh, select committee to study barriers to serving on city boards and commissions and make recommendations for changes. Um, because I, you know, we have one vacancy, we're fortunate. I think there's other commissions that have more vacancies. Some of them are having a hard time actually managing a quorum. Uh, so um, I think it's, kind of, it's important for us to, uh, you know, to do the survey and hopefully, um, 
you know, they'll get some good information from all of us and maybe they can make some effective changes to the administrative code that would actually provide, um, you know, provide a little assistance in getting some of these commissions up to uh, fully staffed. So, but you can just do that at your leisure. It's uh, it's anonymous in essence. So you don't have to worry about, um, you know, I didn't, didn't ask for your name. I got that, I got that far and then I kind of paused it. So, <laughs> so that, that's, that's really about all I, that's all I had. Anyone else have anything else not anticipated by the chair? Jen. I just should um, let you know, I got um, uh, contacted like several people out from Grow Food Marks Hampton is, uh, I just wanna make you aware that they are um, gonna do a reforestation project on part of the land there down there. And, I kind of got looped in um, and and uh, they're going to have me look at the plans and um, I will communicate back to you, Rich, about I don't know where it is or what it involves or but I will um, let you know. And I thought it was a chance for us to also kind of collaborate with them if they need to purchase trees or, you know, I it's in the rudimentary form planning form right now. Um, is that so, city land or is it? Um, it is uh, leased to them. Leased to them, I think. Got it. Thanks. I think. Is it the American Farmland Trust? Maybe they were involved in it somehow. Yeah, I, I'd have to look it up on our GIS map. I, I thought the city owned it, but hmm. it's leased. Anyway, just curious. Which yeah, so know? once I meet with them, I'll let you know you know, kind of what they're doing. And I just thought it would be a chance for, you know, if they needed trained volunteers to train other volunteers, you know, I wanted to loop in Tree Northampton. And so I just thought it was a good opportunity. So, so Jan, along the same lines, that piece of little strip of land by the Maplewood shopping where they planted and then we kind of planted also. I did meet with Felix. It's probably who you're talking to. Uh, no, this was actually the direct, the assistant director or something. Oh, there's two organizations. There's Felix, with who plants edibles with school children and things, and right. then Grow Food Northampton is the group that has a big community garden. Right. Sorry. Okay. And farmer yeah. down down by the fields in Florence. The I take it all back. Yeah, they're both growing. Yeah, yeah. different. I, I different. Did. <laughs> offer so with Felix I did say if you want to plant trees somewhere and they and you want them to be uh fruit bearing you know come to us and we'll see if we can work with you so I think it's mm -hmm. a great thing to, because it brings more people into the project sure so, Felix is help yourself I help think. yourself right yeah um uh, I just looked it up and all that land is actually owned by Grow Food in Northampton Oh, they bought it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I just Sorry. want to, I want to clarify for the record, uh, Bonnie, that Felix does not, he grows plant edibles for, and works with children, not edibles in the sense of other edibles. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sue, I just had to mention that. I am on record now, but I just want to make sure that we're on the up and up. Okay. Yep. Got it. <laughs> Berries and fruits. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Okay. All right. Um, any anyone else have anything? Uh, next meeting, I will have the seedling mastery warden seedling list for everyone for to review. Uh, I'd like to lock in. I think Sue, we sold six hundred seedlings last year. We we I'm not sold. I'm sorry. We actually gave away about six hundred. Yes. Yeah. So I think if we want to do 600 again this year, we can. Um, so I will get that to you. Carol uh, has her hand up. Yes, Carol. So are you giving away pawpaws? Have you thought about pawpaws? I mean, they're small trees, but they're native edible. And we, we you are, you, it's you. Yes. Uh, I'm actually the seedling coordinator for Mass, Seed, Mass Tree Wardens. And yes, we have pawpaws this year. I That's was able to secure great. them. So, hmm. so they I'm, would be very popular. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you. And I was fortunate uh, when I we 
I do the seedling selection in the late summer, early fall. And I was um, uh, did a little better job this year of capturing some um, seedling material that we weren't able to get in years past in Paul Paul. Mm. So mm. Sold out the last two years. And sorry to talk so much, but yeah. that might be really good for schools, you know, to plant pawpaws, because then the kids, for kids to work with them and get the fruit and all that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what we've done, if we if we have leftover seedlings, we actually, we propagate them in our nursery until they get to be uh, large enough to put, um, like in, well, True Northampton had a nursery at the state hospital, I mean, sorry, at the community gardens, excuse me formerly state hospital property. Um, and then they they distribute them there. The pawpaws were gonna be give, possibly giving away are only 48 inches tall. <laughs> it would be pretty hard to keep them out of school unless they were in some kind of planting mm -hmm. area or a ra like a raised bed for the time being and then transplanted out. But mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. I think it's really just about the whole concept of giving away um, plant material that in essence provides fruit that will become edible at some point, I think it's really important. Um, so I'll have that list for everyone at our by our next meeting. Any other business not anticipated by the chair or any other questions, comments from the public? All right. Date for the next meeting? I'm sorry, what, Diane? Date for the next meeting. Uh, it will be, let me look. Our next meeting date is going to be the 18th. We meet the first and third yep. Wednesdays of every month. So it'll be the 18th of, uh, 18th of January. Thanks so much. I knew there was a, a, a formula to it. First and third. That's great. Yep. All right, if uh, no one else has any other business, uh, we're gonna entertain a motion to adjourn. Jackie's, Jackie's, Jackie's making the motion to adjourn. How about that? <laughs> I'll uh, move to adjourn the meeting. All right, uh, there's a, do I have a second? I'll second. All right, uh, there's a motion to adjourn and it is seconded. Uh, any discussion on the motion? All right, I believe that will do it.